Hey everybody, today's worship experience is going to be starting in just one minute. And today we're kicking off a new series called The Greatest Month of Generosity Ever with today's teaching titled Reflecting a Generous God. So please find your seats, please turn your phones on silent, and we'll be back in just one minute to let you know some things that are happening in the church. See you soon. to be with you guys this morning and that you have chosen to spend some of your day with us today. My name is Alyssa and I get the honor and privilege of welcoming you new to this morning's worship experience. If you're joining us online, please comment. Please let us know that you are joining us in community. We are so excited that you are here and we just want to say welcome. For tithes and offerings, please send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or you can place those tithes and offerings into the box which is located at the front of the stage and you can do that after today's service. Well, today's Halloween and it's also our trunk and treat event. So it'll be happening tonight from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. We are excited to be out there with you guys, handing out candy and just having a good time. And we hope that you guys will stop on by. So again, come see us from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. tonight for our trunk and treat event. We cannot wait to see you. We want to just thank everyone for their generous givings for our Stuff the Turkey event. We have been able to collect lots of food for the food bank and we're looking forward to giving that to the food bank right away here so thank you so much for your guys' generosity and now without further ado let's bring up the band and get this service started Bye. Let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater, we need you more than ever, show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. your mercy rescue for your glory we cry Jesus set our hearts towards you that every eye would see you lifted high King of 
of heaven come now let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up you can stand against us you are strong to say in your mighty name king of heaven come
without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill. Some of you are there, but we are all together. I want to tell you a story. It always seems to be a good place to start is with a story, and 
As with all stories, this story starts in the beginning. Have you ever thought about those words? In the beginning. At the start. In the beginning, God had absolutely everything that he needed. There's no need for anything. He existed in what I kind of like to call eternal community as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning, at the, at the, at the start, that was all there was, and that was all that God needed. He, he was sufficient in and of himself. He didn't need anything to make him happy. He didn't need the latest PlayStation or any of the other things that we cling to. He was, he was sufficient in and of himself back there in the, in the beginning. But then something happened. We don't know what. But this something that happened is actually the beginning place for the Bible. Because the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God who had everything he needed, God who was self-sufficient in and of himself, God who, who doesn't need anything from us, decides that he will create everything that we know. In fact, not only will he create everything that we know, he will create things far beyond what we know. He, he, he created the, the earth. He, he, he created the sun. He created the moon. He created the stars. Back then, people kind of thought the stars were just little diamonds or something up in the sky. We know much better now that they were complex worlds just like our sun is, with some with solar systems and some with, with, with you know, many other things that we don't know. We can't, even now, we don't know the, the extent of, of the majesty that God created in the beginning. We know our corner of it. But there are things that we see in that night sky that we don't quite get yet. We've never been there. We've, we've never touched it. Except maybe with our eyes for some of it. But all of this God created in the beginning. The Bible says that God separated the water above from the water below. That he created fish to swim in the water below. That he created birds to fly in this space between the water above and the water below. That he gathered the water together so that land appeared. And on that land, he, he put vegetation. And on that land, he put animals. Majestic lions and tigers. He, elephants and mice. He, he created everything that we see, including at the end of that day, doing something very radical and very different. Again, here's how Genesis records it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and, all, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them in the beginning. Didn't need to. There's nothing inside of him that said, I, I, I have to do this. I'm not, I'm not fulfilled as God unless I do this. He just simply did it. Out of the generosity of who he is. He gave life to something that 
wouldn't fulfill him in any way. And he gave to us everything that we would need. He put us into this beautiful garden, which had all of the food that we would need. He, he gave us all the animals. We started to name them. Don't know how in the world we came up with kangaroo. But anyways, you know, or aardvark. That was another good one. Uh, but, but, you know, we, we, we got to name all of these strange and wonderful beasts in the beginning. And you would have thought that maybe we would have been thankful. But we weren't. And we rebelled. We chose to do what God had told us not to do back in the beginning. And we got kicked out of the garden. You would have thought we would have learned our lesson, but apparently not. Because a few genera generations later, we just about got kicked out of the earth. But still, something within God said, I've got something for you. Out of the generosity of my heart, I will give to you what I have. And he saw a man named Abraham, and he, and he went and he talked to Abraham, and he had this conversation. He said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. In my nature, in this generous God, I will bless you. I will give you everything that you need. And out of the abundance, you will go out and you will share what I give you to the rest of the world. I love those words. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Abraham, here it is. I'm going to bless you, and, and the world will be blessed through you. I will bless your descendants, and the world will be blessed through them. Just imagine that. Except that in Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, which lived right next door to Abraham, apparently didn't get the message. And they reacted selfishly, and they were destroyed. God kept on calling, kept on blessing, kept on exercising his, his generosity towards his creation. In the days of Moses, he brought these, this slave people out of the land. He gave them everything that, that they needed to become a nation. He, he brought Moses up on top of the mountain and said, here, these are my commands. Do this. And everything's going to be great. All of my generosity will be poured out on you. And while Moses is up on the mountain, the people down below are making a golden calf and saying, this is your God, the God who brought you out of Egypt. God's generosity still hadn't ended. He kept on pouring himself out into kings and into leaders until he got to a time when there was a big bully on the earth. They were called the Assyrians. And the Assyrians took whatever they wanted. And it was, you know, when you heard that name, when the Assyrian army was on the march, you were scared because of what they would do. And God looked down on the earth during the time of the Assyrians. And he saw a city called Nineveh, which was an evil city. And he said, I'm going to pour my generosity out on Nineveh. I will call my prophet. I will send him to this evil city of this evil empire. And he will tell them about me and they will respond. And I will pour out my generosity on them. So he sent a message to his prophet. He said, I want you to go to Nineveh to preach. And his prophet, a man named Jonah, said, I don't think so. 
I don't want to go there. God, they do not deserve your generosity. I know, but I'm sending you anyways. Go, go. No. I'd rather go to the south of Spain and have a holiday, which is exactly what he decided to do. And God caught him up and took him and physically placed him in a position where he did not want to be so that he would hear his words and say, I need you to go to Nineveh. So Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached. And he preached in Nineveh. And the people of Nineveh, the people of Assyria, repented. Because God had come to them in generosity and given to them what they needed. We still, we, we know this as, as, as teshuva, which means repentance. The story of Jonah is still today sp- told, spoken, on the day of, a, of atonement, the Yom Kippur. It's in the afternoon of Yom Kippur, the story of Jonah is still told because it is the story of teshuva, of, of, of repentance. And, and the person who chooses this this path of repentance is called a Baal Teshuvah, which means master of repentance. And Jonah saw the wonders that God had done. And he praised God. Well, not really. Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. But you have to understand, God, I wanted you to send calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. I don't want a generous God. I want a vengeful God. I want a God who's going to take my anger out on the people that I'm angry with. Have you ever felt that way? That's the way Jonah felt. And God says, no, no, you don't, you don't understand my generosity. It is, it is overflowing. It is, it is over all of the bounds you might set for it. Even the Assyrians are, 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 worth, are, are, are worth my generosity. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the, for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everything else. In the beginning... God started off this world with generosity and in the now, he expects us to carry on that generosity. That first blank that you're looking for should be that generous people see the world differently. There we are. We're back up. I just got to connect connect myself now. Generous people see the world differently. Often we see what we want to see. You will see what you think you should see. You will miss what you're not expecting. Years ago, I took a bunch of teens on a what we called an emotional scavenger hunt. And yes, I was soundly... Um, I was soundly, I'm not getting this, <laughs> soundly criticized for what I, for what I had done because we went downtown. And I had about 20 teens with me and we we're just going to go for a walk through downtown. It was like a Friday evening and there was a few people down there, although not as many as I thought there might be. And so we, we, we started to walk through the downtown area. And I said, just look on the faces of the people and and see what emotions that you see. 
And so we're, we've been walking for about half an hour and we paused at a place. I said, so tell me, what emotions have you seen? And the teens go, what? Emotions. What, what, what have you seen? Uh, nothing. Did you see that, that, that woman with her child? The child was, I don't know what, she was happy or something, but mom, mom was a little cross. Did you see that? No. What about the three homeless people we passed just back there? What, what did you see on their faces? We passed homeless people? So I shouldn't tell you this, but you know, in the last half hour, we passed two drug deals. What did you see, what did you see there? What? So I gave them a rule that I don't think they appreciated at the time. But I said, I want you to just be quiet. Don't talk to your neighbor. Just look. Watch. Open up your mind to what is happening around you. See what is there. And so we walked for another 15 minutes. And by the time we got to that end, end of that 15 minutes, I'm pretty sure some of them were crying from some of the emotions that they witnessed in downtown Edmonton. Some of the pain, the hurt. What have you seen? Generous people will see the world around them. When, when, when God came to Moses, he said this, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their, their suffering. I have seen them. You, you, you can't be concerned about somebody that you, that you don't see. And generous people start by seeing the world that is around them, just as, as God sees this world. I have to tell you that one of the scripture verses in the New Testament that absolutely freaks me out is when Jesus sends out his 72. Do you remember that story? 72 disciples that are around Jesus. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you out. Here, here's what he says. He says, go, I'm sending out like lambs among the wolves. Is that, if that's not enough to scare you, right there. I am sending you out, out like lambs among the wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. Now, you have to understand that when I was young, especially, I'm, I'm a little better now, uh, basically because I have credit cards in my pocket, but when I was young, I used to have a habit of squirreling away money in my wallet where nobody knew it was, just in case. Car might, might break down. I might need money. So I'd squirrel it away. It'd be hidden. Nobody could see it. I knew exactly where it was. I'd have to dig to get it to it. Do not, not only do not squirrel away any money in your, in your wallet, do not take a purse. Do not take anything with you. Just, I'm sending you out. Go. Survive on the kindness of others. I want to show you a video. I hope it's going to work. Um, it's from a morning show um, a little while back. It, it's, it's Leon Legothetis. Legothetis? Um, and his adventure as he goes out, and he basically lived these words. So I'll let, you t I'll let you hear the story from him. Here it is. You know, the saying, kindness makes the world go round. Well, Leon Legothetis made that a reality. He traded in his desk job to chase his dreams. That meant traveling the world, living only on the generosity of strangers. He went to 40 places in nearly 20 countries in five months with no money, food, or places to stay. That journey is captured in his new book, The Kindness Diaries, One Man's Quest to Ignite Goodwill and Transform Lives Around the World. Leon, welcome. Thanks for having me. You're working as a successful broker living in London. You gave it up. I did. Why? You know, I felt disconnected 
I didn't feel any sense of purpose. I didn't want to work behind what I used to call a slab of wood. And I wanted to go out and see the world and be inspired by people. You keep, in, throughout the book, you say you were listening to your inner rebel. What is the inner rebel? The inner rebel is the part of you that wants to go out and live fully and uh, not live other people's lives and live your dream, your own dream. We all have our own dreams. Well, someone's dream could be to travel, but then to maybe spend some of the money <laughs> that they've had working for the past three years. Why did you decide to do it and do it through the kindness of others? Like I said, as a kid, I felt disconnected and I felt disempowered and I wanted to empower people and I wanted to um, the magic of kindness is really what makes the world go round and so many times we see bad things happening but there's so much kindness out there there's so much good stuff so you walk up to somebody and say hi I'm Leon can I stay with you tonight sometimes sometimes <laughs> and the reaction I, I, is the reaction mostly is is no you can't <laughs> but sometimes you find that angel and that angel wants to help it, obviously, in the book, you set up a series of rules. You said you were not allowed to accept money, but surely there had to have been times when you thought money would really be the easiest solution here. Absolutely. But, you know, the rules were there, no money. It was just generosity. And it was a wave of generosity that got me across the world. Give us an example. What is an example of generosity? For example, um, I met this homeless man called Tony who had nothing. And uh, he decided, he let me stay the night on the sidewalk with him. And he was such a wonderful man. He, was, he inspired me to realize that true wealth is in our hearts, not in our wallets. Mm -hmm. What do you think you learned from this journey? You know, truthfully, I learned that that kindness is what makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. And we all have so many negative things happening, and we see the news, but it's really, there's so much kindness out there. But you also say, in the terms of the disconnected, because we all now, since we have mobile phones and computers, we think we're more and more connected, that the world is more flat. And you have a different view of that. You know, I, I definitely do. I actually don't have a smartphone. Um, I have like a, a 1998 really? Nokia, um, and it's because I loved the Nokia. <laughs> is that, yeah. that, was is a that great a flip phone? phone? Yeah. Is it a flip? No, no it's a little small, one. tiny like thing oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, I love that phone. Yeah, those were indestructible, and, 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 it, and it is. Although I do have tape around it, yeah. but basically, I feel like connection is what's going on here. You know, connection isn't about tweeting and Facebooking and all this kind of stuff. It's the human connection. It's the power of I see you and you see me. That's what human connection is all about. It's true. Any favorite spots? You know, my favorite spot was Bhutan. They have gross national happiness where they determine the happiness of the country by how happy the people are. After seeing so much kindness, you made some pretty big promises, basically paying it forward. When did that idea, I mean, when did you realize, I want to do something for all these people who've done so much for me? You know, I'd done some adventures before where it was about receiving kindness. And this, I made sure, was about receiving and giving. For example, Tony, I was very fortunate to put him up in an apartment, send him back to school. This is the homeless man yeah. you met. So, you know, he's not homeless anymore. And, and to me, that, that feels wonderful for me and, and obviously for him. And uh, it's just a, it's a wonderful thing. You talk about the struggle with kindness in that sometimes when someone is truly kind, they shouldn't be writing a book. They shouldn't be telling people because they're not expecting something back. Did you struggle with the idea of a book? I did. And, you know, to begin with, I remember I read a book once and it said, a true act of kindness is when you don't tell anyone what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, here I am telling people what I'm doing, but I just felt it was something that was so powerful and, and the stories I had and the people that I met were so inspiring that I wanted to share it. Really quickly, what's next? What's next? More adventures, more giving back. Well, you already hit 90 countries, so you're doing pretty good. <laughs> Leon Logo thesis, thank you so much. The Kindness Diaries is on sale now. You're watching CBS This Morning. I love that line that he says, the power of I see you and you see me. The power of I see you and you see me. It's where kindness, it's where generosity starts. It's just in this willingness to be able to see each other. Again, going back to the words of Paul in verse, in verse 11 of our passage this morning, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. You will be enriched. I will give you what you need. I will allow you to see if you want to see so that you can spread my generosity so that I can bless you and you will bless them. 
Second thing I want you to note is generous people are offer an intimate image of God. Generous people offer an intimate image of God. It is who God is. As I was working through this week, I actually hit a, a passage that I've, I've, al- I've often thought I knew exactly what it meant, and then I realized I had just barely scratched the surface of it. Here's the passage. It's from the Gospels, and it says, Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the part I thought I got. That's what I thought the message of this little passage, words of Jesus was, was that I will be resurrected someday. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the, middle, in, in, in the, in the middle of a fish, I will be three, three days and three nights in the, night, in the earth. But listen to what he says right after that. The men of Nineveh will stand up at ju- with judgment. Ah, will, st- will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. They heard the words of Jonah and they repented. How much more should we hear the words of Jesus and repent? Something greater is here. We get to see the generosity of God poured out through Jonah on Nineveh, but that's just a small part of the generation, gener- the generosity of God poured out on us, on our culture through Jesus Christ. Tonight we are going to gather, a few of us are going to gather out in the, in the field. We'll have our cars and some of us will be in costume. I'm going to wear my bandito mask, cowboy hat, I, I, if I had a gun, you know, but I, I don't, and I probably shouldn't. I'll try to scare all the kids away. But there's candy, so we know that's not going to happen. We're just going to gather, we're going to give out candy. It doesn't sound like much, does it? But I really believe this is the overflow of the generosity of us. So, we've done this for a few years, and uh, every year we have... We, we, we have re- re- returned customers. <laughs> they, we have people that come say, I, I was here last year. I'm bringing more friends this year. I was here last year. Thank you for doing this. One lady said, why don't more churches do this? I said, I don't, I don't know. But we do it. There's this gratitude that comes to us for our generosity from this community. One of the things I, I, I said when I, when I first started here was that I didn't want this church to be meaningless to this community. I, 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 if something were to happen to Vantage Point, if this building was to be closed down, I would hope that we had made enough of a connection with our community that the community would miss it. It's my hope. And we do this through a few things that we do with the community. One of them is just this little trunk or treat thing right out there. Last year, I think we had 250 people on the lot just coming through for trunk or treat. Most of them have never been to church, but we get to touch them. But there's always somebody who doesn't quite get it, and, and, and that was no different this year. We got a little message through Facebook saying, don't you, don't you understand that Halloween is a pagan ritual? What are you doing as a Christian church being part of a pagan ritual? And if I could respond to that person, I would say, don't you understand that God poured out his generosity on all of us? 
even when we weren't anywhere near him? Don't you understand that God poured out his generosity and his love and his kindness on Nineveh during the days of Jonah, who was pagan and evil, and, and, and Jonah wanted nothing to do with that? Don't you understand? This is the overflow of the generosity that God has, has poured out on us. I, I'm okay. I know it's a pagan ritual. Maybe we can call it somewhere, someone else. We were goofing off in, uh, in our Bible study this morning. I said we could call it Neowalla, which is Halloween backwards. That makes it heavenly, right? Just spell it backwards. Of course, then I've got a problem with Nevea because that's heaven spelled backwards, which we won't go there. Um, but don't you understand that this is the overflow of the generosity? That God doesn't just love us? That he loves them too? That he has been generous to them too? That God sent Jonah to Nineveh? And Jonah was saying, you know what, God? Save your generosity for us. We're the ones that serve you. Don't go out to that pagan world out there. They don't need you. Don't we understand? Again, this is what Paul, what, what Paul wrote to, to the Corinthians. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people. Can I, re, can I reread that? This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but also overflowing to many in expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the, for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. That last blank is generous people see the world differently. Not only do we see the world, but we, we see it with heavenly eyes. We see it differently. Number one, they recognize that the resource pile is not finite. See, if I think the resource pile is finite, then if I give you something, that means I lose something. I have to do without. But that's not the way it works. When we're interconnected in, the, in our society, when we bless another part of our society, when we pour out on someone else, it's not that our pile is smaller and theirs are larger. We grow our piles together. It's the story that Jesus told of the parable of the sower. Of the sower. Remember that? The farmer goes out and he spreads the seed. And some of the seed falls on rocky ground. Where it springs up quickly, but there's no, there, there, there's no dirt there or not enough dirt there for the root to take, to take root. And so it burns and shrivels. Some of the seed falls among the thorns. Where the, where the weeds choke the life out of it. But some of the seed falls on good soil where it will produce 30 or 60 or 100 times what was sown. The moral of the story is not so go out and sow seed on good seed. That's what we think it is. That's the way, the way at least we act. Go and, and sow your seed on good ground where it will multiply. The moral of the story is sow your seed wherever it will fall. Some of it may not grow. That is okay. Because some of it will fall on good ground and it will grow. But go and sow your seed. The resource, the, the resource pile is not finite. When we sow our seed, it grows. 
Number two, they know that generosity leads to greater happiness. There have been studies that have looked at this where they said that generous people just are simply happier people. There is a reason why Scrooge is such a Scrooge in the movie. Because he's a grouch. Because he's hoarding everything that he has. And yet, on the other side, we have, you know, that family that is happy even though they have nothing. They, 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 they are seeing the world differently and their generosity has led them to greater happiness. Number three, they find success in helping others succeed. Just, just imagine that. That my success is not tied up in what I do. My success is tied up in helping someone else be a success. That I can find success in helping someone else succeed. That I can, I can spend time with someone. That I can love on somebody, someone so that their path changes and they become a success. And that is part of my success. Number four, they believe in that changing even one life is worthwhile. It's a good one. Because we have this mental attitude that says, well, I can't do this for everybody. And we can't. I can't fix the world. But maybe I can make my corner of it just a little bit better. Maybe I can touch one life. I had an acquaintance a number of years ago um, who had a very strange, to me, policy about visitation. Um, his policy was that he couldn't go out for coffee with everybody, so he would go out for coffee with nobody. And I'm going, I'm sorry, I don't get that. I understand I can't go for coffee with everybody, I get that. But I cherish the people that I do get to spend time with. That life is important to me. Yeah, sure, I wish I, wish I could do it more. I wish I had time and that I could, you know, just spend my life doing this. And even then, I probably wouldn't have enough time to, to get everywhere, but, but that's okay. The ones that God has led me to, I'm grateful for that time because changing even one life is worthwhile. They trust others. It's hard to be generous if you don't trust. If I'm being generous with you and I think you're going to waste what I'm giving you, then I probably won't be generous with you. But generous people tend to trust others. They dream big dreams for their money. We talked about Hetty Green last year, last week. Hetty Green was uh, a woman who had some money back in the early 20th century. She died in 1916. She lived in a small suite of rooms. She paid $5 a week, or yeah, $5 a week for her living expenses. She laundered her dresses just on the bottom where they were dirty. Her son had to have his leg amputated because she wouldn't pay for a doctor to look at it until it was too late. Hetty died with $100 million in her bank, which by today's standards would be about $26 billion. Surviving on $5 a week. See, generous people know that money isn't anything by itself. It's what you do with it. It's how you spend it. And yes... Sometimes we spend money on selfish things, and sometimes that's okay. But generous people want to dream big dreams for their money. They want more from their money than just that. They want to see the world changed by what they have. Number seven, they see more resources to give than money. 
Money is often the easy thing to give. They see more. They see time and talents and experience that can be also donated to the world around them to make it a better place. They can give this. They fully embrace the reality that life is short. We won't be here forever, so what is the image that we are leaving for those who follow us? Is the story that I told about Hetty Green last week and this week, is that the story that Hetty wanted to be told about her life? Or do you think that maybe she, if she was here, she would wish that story was something else? We, they embrace, they fully embrace, generous people fully embrace the reality that life is short. And I have only a limited time to do something with what God has given to me. The last one, I'm just going to leave, leave it on this, is they are content to live with less. Because the reality is, if we're not, that it will consume us. No matter how much money you make, no matter how much money you have in your bank account, you will always need more. God started off with this idea of generosity and gave to us and his hope, I believe, is that we will latch on to that and live our lives in a generous manner. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about every place where we go. Every moment that we live, be generous. Nelda was out with a friend on Friday and they decided to go to Tim Hortons to get something. And she pulled up to get her whatever it was, I wasn't there. Her coffee, her donut. And she went to pay for it and the person said, no, the person ahead of you paid for it. Just a small act of generosity to somebody that I don't know. An overflowing of everything that God has already placed on me. Generous people will change the world. Let me pray. Father, help us to be generous. Help us to trust when trust is not easy. Help us to understand how deep your generosity is and to attempt to reflect it as we are made over into your image. God, may you open our eyes so that we can see. We can see the, the, the opportunities that are all around us for us to be generous. That God, we can be generous with every aspect of our lives. Help us to be generous with our attitudes as we meet with other people, as we love on other people. God, help us to be who you intended us to be. Make us a generous people that reflect you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
thank you for your love and for your generosity. And God, we just ask that you will be, without, be with us as we leave this place, God, and spread that generosity to the rest of this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, we just want to remind you, if you have tithes or offerings and you'd like to give, you can send them in an email transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or just drop them in the box here on the corner of the stage on your way out. Let's end with one more song.
God is the one and only Lord. Therefore, go out into the world and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love others as you love yourself. And may God give you justice and freedom. May Christ Jesus set you free for love. And may the Holy Spirit go where you go and protect you on your way. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Grace and peace be with you. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next week right here at Vantage Point and on Facebook.